Jenna Friedman's comedy special Lady Killer is available for streaming on Peacock. I'm Matt Noble at Gold Derby, and I want to kick things off, Jenna, by asking you, what joke on Lady Killer was the one that took the longest for you to refine? Oh, there was a joke that wasn't really funny because it was, I was working on a true crime show as I was uh, prepping for Lady Killer. And I had found out that um, pregnant women, um, one of the leading causes of death uh, for pregnant women is homicide because their partners kill them. And it's the least funny thing ever, but a lot of my comedy starts with what's a terrifying thing that either scares me or makes me angry and how do I make that funny? And so in this special, when I talked about that being the male version of abortion, it's like still not. I'm laughing at it because, you know, half jokes make me laugh. But I think that was the one that uh, even as I was delivering it, I'm like, I need a couple more weeks to get this really refined. Um, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. And what 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 is the sort of process for you as you work on your material and stuff? Because I imagine different comics approach it sort of differently. I write a lot of my comedy while I'm on stage. Uh, for this particular special, I uh, it was during one of the COVID waves and I was pregnant. So I wasn't really performing at clubs indoors. So I did a lot of outdoor shows to prep. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, typically if I'm in New York, uh, I'll try to do as many shows as I can. You can sometimes do like five spots a night and you're just writing a joke, record it, tell it again on stage, tweak it. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, stage time to really get a joke to work in every audience that you do it. Yeah. Like, something also interesting about sort of your style and approach is that like, and you said there when you were talking about the homicide thing that like, Oh, I guess it's not really that like good a joke. A few times you call out, that's not a good joke. And we've got a worse one coming up later. What, like how is like that sort of uh, maybe uh, honesty or self-deprecation, uh, part of your act and what you do so as you're working out your hour uh you come up with you, it really is like a conversation with the audience where obviously only you have the mic but there's so much a part of it and in all my stand-up there have been times where I really wanted to say something but it's not yet working but then if I can have a tag that kind of breaks the fourth wall and makes a joke about the joke then I can get it to work again um so those kinds of like self-deprecating moments are really just me trying to kind of shoehorn in this crazy concept to an audience and then being able to once I can, like, for example, there was a joke about miscarriages in the special, which had worked before I was pregnant. So I knew the joke was good. But once I was physically showing, I think it scared people. Mm. And so as I was doing it, I was like, why aren't people laughing at this joke that has worked in the past? And then I think I added a tag that was like, if you don't laugh, you'll stress out the baby. And then it's, people just kind of respond to that. And I don't know, that's my favorite type of comedy to do. I, I A lot of comedy, especially when you've worked in the clubs, like it, it has a formula and I know it makes people laugh, but then to kind of push them a little further is really what makes it at least interesting for me to keep doing it. Yeah. It, you were pregnant when this special was on. So like you, you couldn't probably do this set again now. Cause a lot of it was about your pregnancy. What, um, what, what, um, how is sort of, um, how you, now you, you've had little, um, Jeffrey Epstein or what's his name now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Jeffrey. We, you know, I don't like everything is special. I, yeah, yeah, no, we, we can call him Jeffrey. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Um, is is he a lady killer? I don't know yet. I don't want to put that on him. No. He's where <laughs> he wants to be. Um, I I will I hope he doesn't I don't know. I don't I had I didn't think about him seeing it when I did it, which is clear <laughs> if you watched it. I, I'm not thinking about him uh or how he feels about the content of it. Um, but he is very talkative and I attribute that to the fact that I was probably on stage doing comedy very very pregnant he's already very chatty so yeah. oh very good um, yeah like some some parents like play music and stuff and you just took one to comedy comedy places 
Yeah, I did stand up with him physically attached to my body once yeah. at an outdoor venue. Um, <laughs> I just, it was a five minute set and I looked down at one point and he was like, <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> It was it was fun, uh, but I'm I'm not going to be doing that frequently because he it's past his bedtime a lot of the shows. Yeah, um, like you you've uh, you've been you were one of the first female writers on the Late Show with David Letterman. You first uh, first time he had two female writers on the show. So there had been Meryl Marco who co created the show with him. Uh, she was the first, and then I think there were maybe six or seven others six others and then when I got there Jill Goodwin was there and it was the first time there were two female writers in the in the writers room how does like writing for a television show when you're writing for stuff that Dave or or someone on that show is going to say compare to writing for yourself uh like a stand-up special well I mean obviously you can take a lot more risks when you're writing for yourself because you're the one who has to either suffer the consequences of the bombs or whatever. Um, it's really, it's, it's a, it's a lot of the same muscles, but you just kind of like know what um, areas they might not want to touch or what areas they will want to touch. When I worked for Letterman, we had a definite intersection, um, but there was a lot of stuff that he wasn't that, I mean, a lot of the jokes that I have would not work on his show. When I worked for Jon Stewart, I was a field producer, segment producer, and we were a lot more in line uh, in terms of the content that I, that overlapped. Um, and then when I wrote for Sasha, it was like a dream come true because the edgiest, creepiest stuff I could think of, he, he like, yes, and did it. And um yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if you watched Borat too, but yes, <laughs> uh, I still think about the period dance and laugh sometimes when I'm <laughs> sad. It cheers me up. Well, we're an awards website, Jenna, and that, of course, I watched Borat because it was an Oscar-nominated film for best screenplay, and yeah. you re- you were one of the writers that received that nomination. What was it like, not just to get an Oscar nomination, but to get an Oscar nomination for that, for Borat, the uh, uh, Borat the sequel, the subsequent movie film? You know, I think that film was such a feat in the time that we did it, which was pre and during COVID. The Oscar nomination was an incredible honor, but just the fact that the movie happened the fact that there was a scene about a pregnancy crisis center, which again, if you see Lady Killer, like a lot of my comedy has a similar theme. The fact that we got that scene in there, the fact that we got other stuff in there, it was such a triumph that, I mean, the only the only like really bittersweet thing about it is that I didn't get to see, none of us got to see the movie in a theater mm. with actual moviegoers. I think that would have been, that movie was such a kind of cultural touchstone at the time that it came out. And and I've been working in comedy for 15 years and I never dreamed that there would be like a period blood dance in a major motion picture. Mm. The cringe factor of that is just off the charts. And to actually experience that with a, with other Americans, uh, I think, or just anyone in a theater, I think would have been incredible. But yeah, I mean, that whole project was a fever dream. It was absolutely awesome. Mm. And I like sort of similar to stand up, I guess, in one way that you sort of Borat's going out there into the world and part of like your writing material that's going to get fed off by mm-hmm. people who haven't heard it before. Well, the cool thing about stand up, I mean, because it's so labor intensive, you're doing when you're, you know, I, I do a lot of different things. So I'll go back to stand up. I'll step away from stand up and work on a writing project. I wrote a book this past year that came out and that mm. was like solitary. Um, but what it gives you improv as well performing in front of live audiences gives you this kind of ability to know what's funny uh when you go to write it and so when you're working on something like Borat even though you never know 100 percent, just from being a, a performer in front of a live audience for so long you're like I think people will laugh at this or they'll definitely cringe at this and so let's try it even if we only have one shot because we're dealing with people in an unscripted environment with very like maybe a one take max um so yeah they all kind of complement each other in that way yeah 
Do, like um from this step oh from from i guess your work from letterman to john stewart to borat to your own like stand-up work what do you think the most important lesson is you've learned along the way about comedy i mean i think anything can be funny if it's coming from a place of humanity um and i think you can really i mean you can make anything funny uh i had a true crime show uh called indefensible on amc plus and that was I didn't think it was possible to combine true crime and comedy because it kind of borders on profane, but the comedy was never mean spirited. And it was always making fun of the systemic injustice in which the, uh, you know, it, the, the kind of larger injustice or the people who perpetuated injustice. And that's kind of where the comedy came, uh, came in. So um, yeah. And I mean, I think I definitely learned that lesson from John when I was at the daily show that you can make anything funny as long as like, you know, you're, you're doing it at the height of your intelligence and from a place of humanity. And then Sasha does that like on full display with his characters. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then with Lady Killer, I, uh, it was such a crazy political moment in which I was uh, performing and working on the show. Um, I felt, I felt like privileged to have the opportunity to kind of scream into a microphone during that moment, while I was pregnant, I think a lot of times, I mean, like a lot of female comics now are getting the opportunity to, to shoot specials when they're pregnant. And that's just a function of more of us getting more specials and getting to stay in the game longer. Um, yeah. But to be able to be pregnant while talking about abortion and miscarriage, I, I feel like it it was very empowering. Mm. Did you, uh, like, so what, what, what bit did you find the funniest in the special? I kept finding things. I I mean, it it was I had to shoot it when we shot it because of just the time frame and everything. Um, but there were tags and things that I discovered. There is a moment I think when I do the call and response with the men in the audience, and um, I just kind of like when I was like playing with like Mama and and I, I I'm blanking on that moment towards the end, but. I was just kind of like teasing the men in the audience and they were really having it. And you can only find those things when you're on stage performing it. Um, that became really fun to do, to just kind of like tease them like, oh yeah, this was the moment when um, I was like, you fucking pussies. <laughs> I forget, I'm sorry, that sounds out of context so bad. But, um, oh, I'm just kidding. So I had this very earnest moment at the end where I was talking to the man about like, you guys should cry or whatever. And then I just embodied a man. I'm like, I'm just fucking kidding you. <laughs> like, pussies. Um, sorry, I hope that's funny to anyone watching. It was so funny. <laughs> Character, you know, I like, I understand that feminist comedy has this like earnest self-seriousness about it. And I don't want to fall into that category. Not like there's anything bad with that category, mm. but to kind of, the script and then kind of embody this kind of hyper masculine guy especially being so pregnant um and i i co-directed the special with shannon hartman as well and um it was really important for me even though i was so pregnant to kind of have my body dissolve and to not showcase the pregnancy after maybe like the first or second shot in the special mm -hmm. because there was just so much i wanted to say and i didn't want people to be looking at my body so I feel if you watch it you'll notice that I'm in this black jumpsuit that kind of matches the curtains in the back so you kind of you kind of can't really see the pregnancy after the beginning of the special and that was totally by design one of my favorite comedians is Bill Hicks and I just kind of love like the minimalist set where you're um really just trying to get the audience to focus on on what you're saying and um, I hope, I hope we accomplished that because it was, yeah, it was a lot. <laughs> <laughs> like you, as you've talked about, like, you're not afraid to tackle really controversial issues and also just like joke about things that other people might be scared to joke about from, you know, miscarriages through to police, through to, you know, a whole, whole range of different things. Uh, what, like, is the power in that and sort of what are you trying to achieve by doing that and touching on those areas? I think, you know, 
I, I post Trump, I think a lot of people look at like the power of comedy, like, can we change culture, blah, blah, blah. And I don't have any answers. I do think though that there is a catharsis and in, in for audience members, if you say something that people are thinking, you make them feel less crazy. And personally, selfishly, like if I can make a joke about something I'm afraid of, then you then that the thing that you're afraid of has less power mm. and you you can kind of connect to community in that. Um I don't know uh if anything I say uh makes any difference on any level, but I do think it it uh th there's like a kind of human connection and it's also democratizing stand up. I mean, we're in these moments where we're so divided. And if you can get people to laugh with you, even people who don't agree with you politically, I do think that that is, there's a net positive there. Um, and that's some, that's sometimes some things I hope to do. I also do swing pretty hard sometimes on uh, Trump supporters. And I, <laughs> <laughs> I feel bad about it to some degree, but then also, you know, I think, uh, I don't know. I've had people who support him at my shows and, uh, I've had people who support him like laugh at my jokes and that always doesn't feel bad. Yeah. I think like sometimes sort of the power of comedy might not be in causing big political movements or change, but just um, as you were talking about, just connecting with other people and sort of the difference it can make in just someone's evening or just someone feeling less alone in yeah. you know, yeah, I agree. And I, and I think um, it's also, it's connecting with other people. Um, and also we're not beholden to anyone else. When you write for other people, everything's filtered through their point of view. Uh, and even those comedians, I mean, I remember when I worked on The Daily Show, I had a segment out about fast food worker strikes and McDonald's was one of the sponsors of The Daily Show. <laughs> segment anyway and we didn't we never felt censored and I think the same thing is with stand-up I mean there's a beauty in like a completely unfiltered uncensored person it, it, it is you know even though our democracy is very much like a fragile work in progress democracy stand-up really does feel like this thing that is such a democratic art form the mm. jokes only work as much as the audience will allow them to work your talking with people you're having these conversations like the miscarriage content was really important for me to shoehorn in there because it's such a common thing and people have miscarriages all the time no one talks about it but then at the same time it's being legislated and the legislators have no idea oftentimes what they're even talking about nobody has nobody elects to have an abortion at eight months that's not a thing people choose to do and so it's a thing that happens out of necessity um, and it's a horrible, horrible decision. And so if we kind of talk about these things that are being legislated, I think hopefully, and maybe not, but hopefully that'll um, help people make sound decisions with who they're voting for. Hopefully it'll inform social policy and make people who have to undergo horrible experiences like that have um, resources to be able to, to do that. Mm -hmm. Like, I guess, Jenna, what is for you the sort of biggest sort of secret or the biggest sort of rule or the biggest sort of, well, rule's probably not the right word, but to comedy. Like, you know, what's sort of the the thing that's most magical, most important when you're approaching comedy and jokes? Oh, I would say it's different for everybody. I am kind of a nerd, so I just like to do it as much as I can. Um, I like to get on stage and prep and just run the set in front of as many audiences as I, as I can run it in front of but also I think confidence you know if you're confident in what you're saying that really translates to an audience yeah um that's awesome well Jenna thank you so much for talking to us today all the best of luck for the Emmy Awards for Lady Killer all the best for all the Emmy Award categories uh directing and writing and uh special so all the best of luck for that people will who are watching this interview, you can go to goldderby.com to follow our awards coverage. And Jenna, just thank you so much for the time. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Matt. Really nice to talk to you. Mm -hmm.